You're watching News Click, and today we are actually going to focus on a new paper which has come out, which kind of uh, brings to a closure all the questions that have been asked about India's statistics. Closure is an odd word to use here because it actually opens up a can of worms. Um, someone I know said that it's quite damning as to what this paper says about what has been happening in the last few years in the way in which there has been a lot of opacity in the data that is being collected and then not being shown to uh, the public, the way in which some of the data which has been collected and then not being released, uh, the way in which the government has, government agencies have actually um, have put a lid on the data which has been collected by the, uh, the state's own agencies and then changed them. So I have with me probably one of India's most celebrated statisticians right now. He was India's first chief statistician. And um, uh, Dr. Sen, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pranab Sen. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were originally an academic, right? You did your PhD from Johns Hopkins and then were an academic. And then sometime in the early 90s, you joined government. And uh, again, uh, from what I remember reading about you, that you essentially started off, uh, uh, your first task was to kind of uh, set, uh, produce India's software policy. You were tasked with deciding what software policy should be. And that, I, we know what happened after that. Now, I, before we go to this uh, new paper, which uh, kind of puts together a lot of evidence of how this kind of obfuscation has been done with data collected officially. Um, I just want to, to explain to our viewers why is it important to collect data for a government, to have this data, for anyone to have this data? Well, you know, Anand, I think the simplest way of responding to that is that the flavor of the day, and it's now been here for a while, mm. is what's called evidence-based policy making. That is, you don't make policy on the basis of assumptions and gut feeling, but on the basis of hard evidence about mm. what is happening on the ground. Mm. Right? Um, and to give you that evidence, data is absolutely central. So you can, of course, have policy making. Mm -hmm. where you make policy on the basis of, I think this is the problem, I think this is the nature of the problem. Alternatively, you can actually use data to both define the problem and the nature of that problem. Mm -hmm. That's why data is important. The second thing that data does is it enables you to track the progress of your policy. Otherwise, you... You implement a policy and you don't have any idea whether it's working or not. Mm. If it's not working, then presumably you have to do something about it. But without data, you can't take that call. So well, that's an interesting point you're raising, that without that data, you can't implement policy and you actually don't have any feedback as to whether that policy is working. Now, right. we are seeing uh, that I think even before this government came to power, there had been questions raised about data that was being Created the changes also that were made to how GDP or GVA would be calculated. Though all those were questioned. Now, my question is this: that we live in a time where people rule in the name of the people, right? So there's a government which names in the rule of the people. They have to go back and get votes. They implement policies to gain those votes as well. I'm being very cynical here. Then why do they not want the data? Everything I think, Kalindo, depends upon how important the evidence is compared to the narrative. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a narrative, mm -hmm. um, which is the driving force behind what you do, mm -hmm. and if the data contradicts it, mm -hmm. then having the dat data available opens you up to uh, criticism and attack. And in politics, and we should be very clear about this. This is not new. Uh, narratives have been the stuff of political discourse. And this has always been true. And still, yes. not, not just in India, it's been true all over the world. 
in democratic societies, narrative are the way politics work. The thing is that in the Indian context, now increasingly in other countries as well, what is happening is that the narratives have to be buttressed by facts. Uh, and this has been happening more and more in the Indian context. Mm. Uh, people then actually start looking for corroborative evidence mm. in terms of data. So now what happens? If the data contradicts the narrative that you wish to project, mm. then one of two things must happen. Either the narrative must change or the data must vanish. Mm. Is there, I mean, uh, when you were in government, you must have, when you first came into government, right? Yeah. And you must have faced a little bit of pushback from the established uh, bureaucracy because they must have said, who are you? You're a technocrat. You've done a PhD. Who are you to decide? And you don't know anything. Uh, you don't know how things work. How, how did you find the times at that time and when you actually later on became the chief statistician and you were representing the government in a certain sense. What changes took place from that time to, let's say, <laughs> at the time when things were working relatively well, better? You know, when I joined government, remember, I'm not a statistician by profession. Mm. I'm an economist. Yeah. Right? So when I joined the government, my, my essential problem was to be able to convince the bureaucracy that I could bring to the table that something that they could. Mm. And the main weapon that I had in my armory was that I understood the data. Right. Mm. The data that was available, I could mm. use it essentially to make uh, an argument mm. which they would have a hard time refuting. Mm. And so my establishment of my reputation was mm. essentially driven by the fact that I could prove what I was saying. So, so if I said, so, yeah, sorry, that, I, I'm just interrupting you. So, uh, sorry, if if you were to get come in right now into the current government, you wouldn't really have any data, right? I mean, where well, well, you no, would have a problem with the data. No, that's not strictly true. I mean, you know, okay. a, a lot depends upon which specific area you're dealing with. So mm. if you're talking about macro data, it's available. Mm. The national mm. account estimates are available. Yes. Right? There, there are other data sets, mostly those which pertain to the conditions of life and living in India mm. uh, that have become problematic. Mm. It's, so there is some data available, certainly. And we can't say that you know, the data has vanished. But, but uh, you know, I've read, uh, I've been uh, for several years tracking your views on this as well. And I, I know that uh, at times you have also been skeptical about the data which has come out, in, even in terms of national accounts. If one looks at the GDP data itself, the, there have been questions raised about the GVA portion. Of it. And if one looks at industrial output, then there is a question to be raised that is there is there an over dependence over estimation made on the basis of what is what we would call organized corporate sector so even there 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 is an issue there and has that issue always existed or do you think that issue has increased when it comes to even macro data which you're saying it exists and is relatively reliable has that issue increased <laughs> well, you know, Anindo, you talked about Arun Subramaniam's uh, criticism, and it's yeah. exactly you were just you're just parroting that criticism. Okay. Um, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that problem always existed, mm. right? Except, except, mm. uh, and here's the big if: mm. earlier we were not producing quarterly data; we were producing only annual estimates. Yes. Right now, annual estimates, by their very nature, gives mm. you more time to collect whatever data you can get your hands on. Mm. Quarterly estimates, you can't. Mm. So, when you do quarterly estimates, mm. what you have to do is to be able to have a sense of what data you can get on a quarterly basis or more frequently than that, 
And how does this data relate to other data that you're unable to measure? Mm. Right? So there is a lot more estimation that gets involved when mm. you're producing quantum mm. GDPs. Mm. That's where the problem comes up. So okay. now, as you said, that mm. what is happening in the quarterly data is that as far as the unorganized sector, or to be more accurate, the non-corporate sector, mm. for quarterly data, we have no data at all. Mm. Zero. Mm. The data that we do have are from mm. corporates. Mm. Right? Now, so long as the relationship between corporate performance and non-corporate performance mm. is stable, mm. that's not a bad way of estimating what the non-corporates perhaps are up to. Mm. 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 The problem comes at the points of stress where we have reason to believe that the corporates and the non-corporates are not performing similarly. All right. And mm -hmm. and I, I, I've seen that you have argued that there is this discrepancy between what is this the MSME sector and what is the big corporate That's sector. Right. And the corporate sector. And mm -hmm. again, this is not new. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2008, when the global mm -hmm. crisis hit us, mm -hmm. right? the corporate sector mm -hmm. was affected much worse mm -hmm. than the non-corporate, the MSME sector. Mm -hmm. right? So when we measure Mm. on the basis of the uh, corporate sector, we are actually mm. underestimated. Mm. Yes. Today, mm. post-COVID, mm. indeed post demonetization mm. we know, at least we have reason to believe that the MSME mm. sector has been doing worse than the corporate sector. Mm. So mm. when we use corporate sector data to, to protect mm. the, the MSME, mm. uh, we are overestimated. So the, 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 this brings me to one of the points that you've raised, that as long as the ratio between what you would call the corporate sector and the non-corporate sector remains more or less stable, then one can use the corporate sector data to say, okay, this is a good proxy for me to say talk That's about right. the entire sector. Right yes. Now, would you agree that one of the things that has happened is that the big, uh, coming in of GST, has moved a significant portion of, let's say, the market. It has increased the market share of the corporate sector compared to the MSME. I mean, not just COVID, I'd say demonetization, GST. And in a sense that we are seeing a double overestimation. One is that we continue to use the corporate sector and assume that that is a good proxy. And the second is we look at GST collection as a... Um, you know, and say that this is also an uh, example of how the well the economy is doing, as you said about a narrative. So, if the corporate sector's uh, weight in the overall economy has increased relatively, GST collections would also go up in a certain sense, right? Yes, they would. They would. And yeah. you know, the point is that GST collection can go up mm. uh, in at least two ways, right? One mm. is that everybody is growing including the corporates, and therefore GSP mm. collections are. Mm. The other way is if the corporates are cannibalizing the mm. market share yeah. of the non-corporates, mm. in which case what you will have on the ground is corporates mm. increasing, mm. the non-corporates actually going down. Mm. And so but you'd get a higher GSP collection, and then you assume that everybody is growing. And effectively, you'll also get a higher GDP, right? Because... Uh, if you there were many the, people who were not not paying taxes earlier, and now their right. tax collection is increased, so the you're adding that in terms of your net taxes and getting no. a higher GDP okay. from GVA, right? No, no, no. But all in those uh, mm. statisticians are not that stupid. Uh, <laughs> adjustment is made for okay. the number of reporting units. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. Okay, when this mm. is done, otherwise, mm. otherwise that would be would be a completely unacceptable way of doing things. <laughs> no, I'm saying that if the if, when you look at the total tax collection of the government, right? Yeah. It is it, possible it for the tax to go up, yeah. taxes to go up, tax revenues to go up, 
even when the economy is overall not doing well, because doing those way. who pay taxes may be getting a higher share a of higher total share. income. That's, that's exactly correct. So that's then exactly. in, in that case, we will not see a great GVA growth, but we'll see a reasonable GDP growth, right? Because... <laughs> well, <laughs> in reality, but since GVA would be measured mm. in a manner... Weighted. In the GST collection actually gets explained by a higher GVA. Okay. Because mm -hmm. the GVA is itself based on corporate. Our corporate, yeah. You're yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, so the two will be together. In the recent period, we've seen that uh, quite often, especially in the quarterly data, the GDP growth rate has been higher than the GVA growth rate. Right? Yeah. Several times you've seen that. Uh, now, for, for a person who looks at it as a lay person, I mean, uh, I look at it and I see that the economy is actually not producing more, but the government is extracting more taxes or reducing subsidies, net subsidies, at a time when it should be doing the opposite. So do, are we seeing yeah. that happen as well? No, no. I, I think there are two different things going on out here. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Taxes are certainly going up, I think, faster mm. than GDP is at the moment. Mm. And, you know, that's not entirely the outcome mm. of the fact that the uh, the corporate sectors are growing at the expense of the MSMEs. Mm. Okay, that's one factor which we've already talked about. Mm. There is a second factor, which is if the consumption basket Mm. is moving towards items which have higher GST rates. That is, mm. you're mm. moving from necessities mm. to luxury. Mm. Your GST collection will go up even if income doesn't go up at all. Yes. Right? Because then the mm. average GST rate mm. becomes higher. Because you're which in itself would higher. also be a reflection of increased inequality. Because one would assume it that... Is, it is a very good reflection of increased inequality. Hmm. So it I, I, then it would be make sense for uh, government to actually uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, massage the data and present it in a particular way. It, it, it's exactly what you're saying. The narrative, it is for the narrative that one would have to do that. No, for the narrative, you don't have to break it down, right? Hmm. You just look at the raw data and hmm. the narrative comes out automatically. Mm. The economy is doing well. I mean, you know, mm. GST is growing strongly, mm. uh, much higher than anybody had expected. Every mm. month we are breaking a new GST collection record. Mm. Mm. So it, it fits in very well with the narrative. You don't have to massage a thing. And of course, no one talks about the fact that GST is always in current prices. So <laughs> you don't have to adjust it for even, even, inflation. Even if I correct, even if yeah. I correct for it. It won't yeah, mm. it's it's still growing at a very fast rate. It will still grow. So but again, I come back to your experience because uh, um, when you joined the government, I'm assuming at that time there was a sense that something big is happening. Right, the early nineties, there may there was a sense that people who were in academia were talking about things and not being hurt uh, could come in and now be part of a process. At that time, a lot of people joined, came in from various institutions to be part of the government. Right? And I'm, uh, I assume you were part of that as well. How did that change? And I, I want to know about that in the sense of the system of collecting data to implement policies, think of new new things to, think, uh, to collect data about. How has that changed till the time that you finally left? Well, uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, remember, earlier, the principal user of data in government of India mm -hmm. was the planning commission. The finance use ministry used some data, but it, it was mainly very aggregated data, such as uh, such as the the national account estimates, but. The Planning Commission was the one entity which used practically all the data that was produced in the system because mm. the five-year plans were so mm. complex. Mm. Uh, number two, that was a time when India 
had a fairly restrained corporate sector. Mm. The bulk of the economy was non-corporate. Yes. Mm. Non-corporates didn't need nationwide data. The kind of information they needed was, was much more localized because they're mm. dealing with more local markets. Okay, and that's that a very was... interesting point. It's a very yeah. interesting point because there are, uh, sorry to interrupt you because one would have assumed that you know, when 90s uh, liberalization took place, one would say, well, the market would take care of things. Why do you need data? But this very important thing that you're saying that as the corporate sector expands, it needs more data about the uh, yes, because national economy they, as a whole. Yeah. The corporate sector addresses the national economy. Mm -hmm. All right. Whereas the non-corporate sector is very localized at best mm -hmm. regional. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, so what happened during the 90s, and if you mm. think about the 91 reforms, it was basically unshackling the corporate sector. Yeah. And so the, the real growth that you get in the 90s is corporate India. Mm. And as the corporates grew, their demand for data grew very rapidly. And just to be clear, you're distinguishing between the corporate sector versus the MSME sector, right? Yeah, uh, but a lot yeah. of the MSMEs became corporate. Also moved, that became right. corporate. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they behave mm -hmm. like corporates. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I mean, born an MSME doesn't mean that you'll continue always be an mm -hmm. MSME. That's, mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happened was demands were then being placed on the statistical system, mm -hmm. which the statistical system had never encountered before. Mm -hmm. Because the planning system didn't need that data. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. Uh, so, in fact, what has what happened is that during the 90s and 2000s, mm. the range of data that was collected actually went up a lot. Mm. You know, people don't realize this. I mean, you see, what, what happens is a lot of the criticism gets mm. restricted to the data that existed before mm. Mm. and which continue mm. to exist today. Mm. And then you're looking at what people miss is that the range of data that you have available today is far, far greater than what it used to be. And, and it's pretty easily available, and actually. It's not that difficult. You go to the easy. internet, it, uh, that, the, it might be yeah. old, but it's not... That, by the way, was a... It, no, it was a struggle, mind you. Mm. Okay. Because mm. um, a lot of this data, in fact, I would say the bulk of this data, actually mm. resides with the line ministries. Mm -hmm. All right. And they were, what should I say, sort of less than enthusiastic about mm. putting it up on their websites. Mm -hmm. So it's taken a lot of persuasion, a uh, mm. lot of arm twisting. Mm. And frankly, it hasn't, it hasn't happened entirely yet. Mm. There's still a lot of data that's available that's not out okay. uh, on the website. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, but uh, there, is, there, there has been a flowering of mm, the just the variety of data that's available today. Mm. Now, in, in fact, quite a data. surprising amount of data is available. You can actually get it district is. level data on the internet, going to the websites of government uh, of ministries. It's uh, really quite amazing how much data is is available. Yeah. So now think of what happens on the when. Mm. All this new data is coming in, mm. and you're getting access to all of this, right? Mm. It then becomes possible mm. for analysts to mm. start looking at the data much more closely. Yes. Right? And when you look at it more closely, you, of course, can criticize it. Mm. Now, the point is the, amount, the volume of criticism you hear about the statistical system is mm. partly about the quality of the data that was collected before and continues to be collected now, mm. but a mm. lot of it is about data that never existed before. Yes. Mm. Right? That's true. Mm. Now, when you conflate the two, then mm. the level of criticism mm. becomes much louder mm. than if this additional data had not been provided. And then it's understandable that uh, any yeah. political party in power would want to not have that data out because you can use, uh, you can actually use any amount. So I'd, I've taken a lot of your time. I'd just take five, six minutes more. Um, you know, I uh, wanted to get a sense of 
where do you think uh, the current state of data collection is? Because some of it is always from the government, but there have also been a, a large number of private data collectors who people are turning to. For instance, I uh, do these weekly videos and my, my go-to now for current, current data is CMI. Right? Um, it, it has been around for a very long time, but earlier people only looked at uh, government data. Now there are these ICE 360, a lot of this is coming out. A lot of data is collected at the booth level by political parties, which, which probably is the only data they want, right? So where do you see this going? No, you know, it's, it's a good thing. But mm. at the end of the day, mm. the fact is that whereas the government data uh, continues mm. to be more transparent than any private source of data and therefore yeah. can be subjected to more criticism, mm. the hopes of reform in government data is higher. Okay. The problem with the private data is that its provenance is unknown. Mm. Unknown. In mm. most mm. CMI, mm. in terms of the consumer pyramids, so mm. for instance, mm. uh, has been very open. Mm. Mm. But it is less so about other data sources. And it's yeah. certainly not mm. very, very transparent earlier, mm. uh, which is why CMI had a loss of reputation some time mm. back. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but the government data is much more transparent. Mm -hmm. Now, because of that, mm -hmm. there is, all, uh, and naturally, I think, more trust in government data because you can actually mm -hmm. analyze it and ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, which is why, if you look at what is happening in India, the data collection and what data is put out is mm. actually fairly good in terms of the technicality of the data. Mm, mm, mm. The problem, as you mentioned in your opening, is that a lot of data is not put in the public domain, is what mm. you would call text. Mm. Right? So would you so say it, that... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it is the suppression which is really the issue. Mm. The data so, that's put in the public domain is, is open for, for people to inspect. So, what is the solution? Uh, I mean, there has uh, there is uh, there are arguments that one has to give statutory status to an independent within the government system, an independent statistical body. Now, is that a solution? But you know, it's a uh, no, that's a that's a contradiction in terms. Hmm. If an institution is a part of the government, no matter then, what yeah, exactly independent status, at the hmm. end of the day they are going to be under pressure from the powers that be. Yeah. Right? I mean, the same criticism is made about the RBI, which supposedly is independent. That, that is, that's true. Mm. And so it, the, mm. the model that was being proposed is in fact the RBI model. Mm. Mm. Okay? But we know how RBI functions. Yeah. Mm. It is independent up to a point. Mm. But when push comes to shove, mm. RBI has to toe the line. Mm. Yeah, it should be true here as well. Mm. Why would we expect anything different? Mm. So, what is what is the solution to the current problem of the deterioration of data uh, data um, that is being put out? The big data. On the, I mean, I agree entirely with you that a lot more data is available from the government than it was earlier. But some of the big data that everyone talks about is the macro data and various other kinds, unemployment and stuff like that. That How does one solve that problem? No, the, the employment, unemployment data is fine. I mean, I don't think there's been been any any real, uh, real criticism of that. No, the fact uh, that it is held back and then released much later. No, what is the, that, mm. the data that is held back are those mm. which describe the life of the common India. That's Consumption, etc. Mm. Consumption, etc. There are lots of, mm. of things mm. on which data is collected. Mm. Uh, now, those are held back. Now, the, what it does is that it has secondary effects mm. in terms of that if these are not being being put out into the public domain mm. uh, and, and, and are getting suppressed, there are certain other kinds of data which get adversely affected. For instance, 
in the absence of the consumer expenditure data, we mm. cannot revise the consumer price index. Yeah. Mm. So we are dealing, working with the consumer price index that is now 11 years old. Outdated. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. totally outdated. We mm. know that. Mm. Uh, we are uh, being criticized, we are under criticism mm. for the fact that the consumer price index is, is outdated. Mm. Uh, but there's nothing we can do until we get the consumer expenditure it, survey date. Mm, mm. So they're all linked up. Mm. The bigger problem mm. is that, that we are going to face in the immediate future is mm. the absence of the census. Census, yes. The census, mm. the census is the build, the essential foundation of mm. any statistic system. Mm. All surveys that are done Mm. are ultimately based either on the census or on the economic census, mm. neither mm. of which has been done. Mm. So what we are doing is we are having uh, sample surveys mm. which are based on the frames which are completely outdated, mm. which means that the samples that we are drawing are becoming mm. less and less representative mm. every mm. Mm. So the quality of the data that you're going to get is going to get worse. Mm. Mm. And uh, on that note, thank you so much for joining me. I've uh, taken a lot of your time. Um, I, I mean, one can only hope that things become better in the area of data collection. And sooner or later, someone knocks on my door to ask how many people live here and what they do as the census does take place. It's, I think the only time this had not happened was during the war, right? And since this is probably the first time that we've not had no. this census. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sen, for taking our time. Thanks a lot and explaining it so easily. Uh, it can only come from knowing this stuff from inside. Thank you very much.